Hi everyone, I'm volcanologist Dr. Janine Krippner and this is my guest. Hello everyone, I'm Professor Claire Horwell. I'm a professor of geohealth at Durham University in the UK. I'm in the Department of Earth Sciences and I'm director of the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, for everyone out there, Claire has been an enormous help to me when I've been trying to answer people's questions about volcanic ash and what people can do to protect themselves. So she is the person I wanted to bring on here to answer some very common questions about volcanic ash. So there are a lot of misconceptions about volcanic ash, starting with what it actually is. So volcanic ash is exploded rock, glass and crystals, effectively. It's if you um, take a bottle of soda and you shake it up and you take the cap off, you have gases explosively expanding, ripping the fluids apart. That's basically an explosive eruption. We have magma, we have gas that's pressurized within that, trying to escape. And once it's at the atmosphere, it finally can. And then it's blowing itself apart and then we have tiny shards of, of magma cooling very quickly to form volcanic ash. So it's very heavy stuff. Um, and it can be a little nasty when you get it in your shoes and everywhere else. <laughs> So what does volcanic ash, how does it actually impact health of people? Yeah, so I guess there's actually two answers that I can give to that question. It depends on scale. It depends on the short term exposure. And then it also depends on the long term exposure. And the problem is that eruptions can go on just for a couple of hours or a couple of days or possibly for decades. And so communities are exposed to really different scales of amounts and durations of ash. And so if you're just exposed for quite a short amount of time, um, for generally healthy people, actually um, there shouldn't be too severe health effects from that. So you might find that you get a sore throat and some eye irritation, you might even get a cough. But if you're healthy, then that might be the extent of it, especially if your exposure isn't for a very long time. The problem comes if you're not so healthy. So you might already have an existing uh, respiratory disease. You might have asthma, for example. And then the problem is that your symptoms are likely to be exacerbated. So if you already find it challenging to breathe sometimes, then that may be made a lot worse. So people who have those kinds of diseases already are going to need to prepare and make sure that they have enough medication to relieve um, extra symptoms. Um, so that's kind of the short term thing, actually not, not too dreadful. Um, but we get really worried about uh, eruptions that carry on for a long time. Um, and then you've got communities who are exposed day in, day out to fresh volcanic ash. And the problem is that when you get exposed to a lot of really fine particles, which you're breathing in, that could start to have a reaction in your body, which might potentially trigger some diseases. And you can get those kind of reactions just from exposure to lots and lots of particles, but also there's particular minerals that we're com concerned about, which we know are harmful to human health. One of those is crystalline silica. Um, a lot of volcanic explosive eruptions, and especially where we have a dome forming component, we might have a lot of crystalline silica in the ash. Now, we're only worried about this because we know that um, in industry, um, workers who are exposed to crystalline silica can come down with some bad diseases like silicosis and lung cancer. And that's why we're worried about eruptions. But I'm going to be honest with you, at this point, we still don't know if volcanic ash can cause these kind of long-term diseases. It is really hard to do those kinds of studies. And as yet, we don't have the right evidence. So we take a precautionary approach and we think this could happen, but we still don't know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's what we do with science is we have the best information we possibly can and use it to protect people as much as we can. So how can people prepare um, with leading up to an eruption and protect themselves during an eruption or after an eruption? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, like all natural hazards. Um, we want to try and prepare communities as best as we can. We want them to be informed about the different kinds of eruptions that their local volcano might have and then what the different hazards will be that will actually come from that eruption. So whether they can expect, expect explosions and ash and gas and all that kind of thing. And once they understand that, then there needs to be some kind of uh, information and training about the likely impacts that that might have on them and how they can best protect themselves. Um, 
So as director of the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network, we have spent a lot of time trying to build the evidence and produce then useful information for the public to get that um, information across to people. Um, so we've got a range of videos, we've got a range of uh, printable products as well, like brochures and leaflets and posters that you can put up on bulletin boards to give that information. And to be honest, the best thing you can do to avoid uh, the airborne emissions from an eruption are to remove yourself from that situation. Um, the international advice would be to go inside, to close your doors and windows and any other ventilation gaps, but do you know what, that is just such a challenging thing to do. You know, so much of the world is in hot tropical places where, you know, buildings are designed to be open and to be self-ventilating. And so that kind of advice is often not very helpful. So we've tried to also look at other ways of protecting people. And uh, one of those, the, the first thing everyone thinks of, particularly at the moment with the current COVID situation is people want to stop themselves breathing in the, the dangerous thing around them. And so we've looked at face masks and uh, we've done assessments of the most um, you know, effective ways of protecting yourself with different kinds of face masks. Um, the best way actually is with an industry certified face mask. Um, in the last few weeks, so many people now know what an N95 mask is. That is the best type, but of course they're hard, hard to get hold of. Um, but our work also shows other kinds of masks can be quite effective as long as people understand the level of protection that they afford. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, um, I've, I've been under very white ash fall and I've, I've got it in my eye and, and that hurts. So, you know, there's the breathing and then there's also, you know, <laughs> you don't want this stuff in your eyes. So having those ways of protecting yourself is important. That's right. I, I will absolutely link to everything Claire is saying below this YouTube video too. Um, so I've heard, I've heard and seen a lot of misconceptions. I've heard people saying that it's poisonous and it's toxic to breathe in volcanic ash and, you know, it's kind of it's bending the truth. So what are some of the big misconceptions you see and, and what, is, what is the actual truth? Yeah, well, this kind of poisonous, toxic um, wording is often used by the media and um, you know, to some extent it's right, particularly for gases, you know, sulfur dioxide can be very, very harmful, particularly for asthmatics. The funny thing is that when we put ash on cells and we do toxicology studies, actually often the cells quite like being in the ash. We don't see a toxic response often. So we are trying to move away from that kind of misconception. We also don't like it when the media call volcanic ash smoke because that gives the impression that somehow the volcano has been combusting something and actually the toxicity of for example wood smoke or burning vegetation of crops and things is is very different from the toxicity of breathing in rock particles um, so you know we want to move away from that and that also kind of leads on to this other misconception that the rock particles themselves are really sharp and like they're going to cut your lungs. Um, we often hear that because people hear that the ash is made of glass. And that's right, some of the ash is made of volcanic glass. But at the tiny, tiny scale of these microscopic particles that you're actually going to breathe in, these particles aren't sharp and they're not abrasive. And We've actually seen volunteers for humanitarian agencies uh, trying to demonstrate to local communities just how bad it is by taking ash and rubbing it on paintwork on motorcycles and showing the abrasion and saying, look, this is how bad it is for you. But it's just not true. So also we're trying to get out that kind of message that, yeah, it's, it's not great to be breathing in these things, but the likelihood is it's not going to do you a lot of harm and it's certainly not going to cut up your lungs. That's great, thank you. Yeah, I've, I've definitely ruined my, my first pair of field work glasses by rubbing the ash off. So yeah, not good for surfaces, not good for glass, yeah. not good for paint, but, but not as bad as people think. So, you know, it's yeah. always important to protect ourselves against these things because, you know, people have underlying conditions that can be triggered and it's always better to be safe than sorry. So thank you so much, Claire. I will ask you after this um, which things you want me to link to so that everything we've covered, people can go and learn more and find those videos and find those pamphlets. Thank you. So thank you so much for joining me for this Volcano Moment. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure.